Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You get one more chance. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, very good. If you would turn off your cell phones, please. Um, don't forget, we have the uh, mouse band books discussion on September 20. I still have a few books left if you want one. Uh, let me know. This Thursday, the Dinosaur Series continues with the evolution of flight. Instructor Taylor McCoy, who was excellent in his first class, will be back to tell us all about flying animals. Um, Tuesday, August 30th, we will have a program on Augustus Pollock, who is, to our knowledge, the only business owner ever to have a monument, and it's a grand one, built in his honor by organized labor. Al Borby and I will present that program, and that will be next week at 12. Following that, on Saturday the 3rd, our annual Labor History Symposium at the First State Capitol, sponsored in part by your local library. Uh, today we're, we have a new subject, something I knew, nothing, mom, excuse me. You get away with a lot because you're mom. Okay. Uh, a subject about which I knew nothing until I read the WVU Press uh, press release about a uh, new book uh, by our guest today. Phoebe Wagner is an author, editor, and academic writing and living at the intersection of speculative fiction and ecology. Her, uh, Wagner's debut novel, A Shot of Gin, is forthcoming from Parliament House Press, and her novels We Survive When We Hold Each Other Up is forthcoming from Android Press. She is the editor of three solar punk anthologies, including Almanac for the Anthropocene, Anthropocene a uh, compendium of solar punk futures from WVU Press that will be coming soon. And she's currently pers pursuing a PhD studying eco-criticism and speculative fiction at the University of Nevada, Reno. She's assistant professor of creative writing at Lycoming College in Pennsylvania. Here is Phoebe White. folks. Thank you all for being here and big thanks to Sean and the library for hosting this. I'm really excited to talk to you all and share about solar punk. Um, so no worries at all if you have no idea what solar punk is. I'm going to be going over it in this talk so hopefully we can all learn something today. Um, but ultimately solar punk stories are about telling hopeful stories for a better tomorrow. Um, but first, I want to just give you a little bit about me because it's all going to kind of come back around. Um, so I grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, which is a river valley pretty similar to actually what I saw here in Wheeling, West Virginia when I was driving around, which was pretty cool. Um, and then I spent some time living in Ames, Iowa, um, where I got my master's of fine arts in creative writing and environment. And then I went out to Reno, Nevada um, for my PhD. So I kind of got to live in a lot of different parts of the country, which was really fun and really informed my environmental thinking and how I think about community and how I think about making community with the people around me. Um, ultimately, I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer, so I love J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, but I wanted to come home to Pennsylvania and teach. I was really invested, even after living in Ames, Iowa and Reno, to come back to somewhere along the East Coast, um, preferably the state of Pennsylvania, to settle down. I ended up coming back to my hometown, actually, and teaching at like Cumming College, which is where I'm at now. So, on hopeful stories, solar punk is ultimately invested in this idea that imagination is a really powerful tool. Now, some of you are probably aware that science fiction has really impacted how we think about our world and how we even exist in this sort of civilization. So science fiction, particularly Star Trek, um, the original series with their communicators that flipped open, that was a really big inspiration for the cell phone, um, which of course has turned into a truly science fiction piece of technology in the smartphone, right? Um, and then also um, William Gibson, who wrote a novel called Neuromancer, he invented the word cyberspace, which particularly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s really impacted how we thought about the internet and digital spaces in general. There was cyberspace and then there was the space that we operated in. Um, so I really started to recognize that literature, particularly science fiction and fantasy, could be a very important tool for making and imagining better worlds. 
And part of the reason I started to get invested in this idea, and particularly in solar punk, is because of the rise of dystopian literature and movies and thinking that we saw in the early 2000s. Some of you all right, remember we had a lot of like zombie movies coming out around then. Mad Max made a re came back in 2015 with Mad Max Fury Road. And we were really invested in this idea as a culture in the US that the future was bad and dark and grim and that bad things were going to happen and we were going to have to survive. And that was sort of this dystopian literature. And my worry in 2015 when I really started, to be, you know, really started thinking about this was what does that mean if we're only imagining bad futures? If we're imagining these dark futures that we all have to survive, what does that mean for us and for our kids and for our grandkids? Um, so instead, I really wanted to start investing in what happens if we imagine better outcomes, particularly for climate change, and then we can start working towards building those better worlds that we're imagining. So before I get into a definition of solar punk, I want to kind of give you a little bit of its history because it is invested in the first sort of punk subgenre. Science fiction and fantasy has these punk subgenres, starting with cyberpunk. Imagine a lot of you probably remember Blade Runner or maybe saw it when it came out with Harrison Ford in 1982. And that is the first sort of, that's one of the biggest examples of cyberpunk. And cyberpunk is exactly sort of what it is, you know, the word means. It's this investment in cyber culture, right? Like the internet and the early computers of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And in this idea of punk, so the loner, the nihilist coming together. Um, so cyberpunk is a dystopic, technology-controlled world. There's no environment, except some of you might remember the acid rain that is like always falling in Blade Runner. Big corporations control the world, um, usually big tech corporations. And then cyberpunk also had a tendency towards like racism and sexism. Um, and you can kind of even see that in some of the pictures up here where there's this idea, there's this fear of Asian supremacy. That was a very sort of foundational in early cyberpunk. So that was kind of some of the issues that it had early on. So cyberpunk was sort of the first punk genre that we had, and then immediately there was a response in steampunk. The word steampunk came in around, it came to be in the 1980s as a direct response to cyberpunk. The popularity and growth happened particularly in the 2000s. There were some really important anthologies that came out around then. Um, and some key hallmarks of steampunk is that it has a very Victorian time period. So it's usually Victorian England or like First World War era is kind of right where it's set. It has the question of what if steam power had become the main source of energy? So that's kind of why you see the clock, excuse me, the cogs and the clockwork. That's where that focus is. Um, it's very interested in the industrial revolution, oftentimes very DIY, kind of scrappy, and you can kind of even see that all in the picture I have up here. This is a really good example of what steampunk is today. Once again, steampunk, like cyberpunk, did have this sort of lack of nature or environment, mainly because the focus was so industrial, and it was really focused in on this cogs and clockwork idea. So now in the US, you primarily see um, it in sort of cosplays and costumes and crafts. If you go into a Hobby Lobby or a Michael's craft store and you go to like their jewelry section, you'll probably see stuff that looks kind of like the stuff I have in the picture up here. So it's still evident in like sort of what is still kind of used today, but not quite as popular as it was um, sort of around 2010. So that brings us to the third punk, which is solar punk. And steam, cyberpunk and steampunk were very much the popular ones of their era. Right now there are a lot of different punk literatures, um, including eco-punk and hope punk, but solar punk has kind of risen to the top a little bit. So this is kind of the next one after cyberpunk and steampunk. So the term first came to be used in 2008, and it grew to popularity online, in online social media spaces. Um, the first anthology came out in 2012, and the first anthology actually came out of Brazil, and was written in Portuguese. It has been translated, but originally that was the first anthology, and that's something that I want to emphasize about solar punk, is even though I'll be speaking about it today in the context of the United States and US literature, it's a very global movement. Um, you know, there's a lot of people working in Brazil, Italy, um, in England, and it's just a very global movement. It's definitely not something that's just here in the US. In 2014, we had um, Adam Flynn started to really solidify what solar punk is with a little piece that came out from Arizona State University's um, Science Center for Science and Imagination, which they've been a big supporter of solar punk since then. Um, and no sort of manifesto just kind of started to be like, okay, what is this subgenre and what can we do with it? And that was one of the early pieces that I read. And then in 2015, I decided I wanted to try and edit an anthology of fiction, art, and poetry that would kind of start to solidify what actually is solar punk. What, are, what is this thing? 
Um, so I co-edited Sunvault Stories of Solar Punk and Eco Speculation in 2017, which was the first general anthology in English. And since then, solar punk has really sort of taken off. There's been a lots of anthology, short fiction, video games, art, board games. Um, it's been in academic spaces as well. I see it on people's syllabi now, which has been pretty cool. But at the same time, there's not really been that really popular piece of literature that has been like, okay, we can point to this and be like, that's solar punk. In the way that you can with cyberpunk, where you can point at Blade Runner and say, okay, that's what cyberpunk is. I think that's actually important, that we don't really have that piece of literature. So I'll kind of connect the dots on that later. But Okay, so now I want to break down. What is solar punk? Um, so it's kind of hard to put it in a sentence. I'm going to actually, I realized when I was working on this presentation, that I'm like, I need to find a one sentence like determination of what solar punk is. But if you Google solar punk, you'll get a couple different things to come up. Uh, this is the definition that I like to operate from when I you know, have an anthology that I'm opening up for submissions or I'm pitching solar punk to someone, I'll use this um, kind of language. So solar punk literature imagines new futures in the shadow of and in opposition to environmental collapse, then works to create those futures. Solar punk stories must recognize the climate crisis and environmental collapse as entangled issues that include all oppressive systems. There is no environmental justice without racial and decolonial justice. And technology is a tool. Use the right tool in the right moment. And one of the things that really attracted me to solar punk that I wasn't necessarily seeing always in environmental literature was this idea that when there is a climate disaster, when something happens that you know there's a flood or there's um, you know too much nitrogen in the soil, the soil gets depleted, that this has a social ramification. So I think Flint, Michigan is probably a really good example that might pop to people's minds. You know, the water, the drinking water quality was not was bad, was causing health problems. So that's an environmental issue. But then we also have the social issue and all the ramifications of trying to fix that problem. And so social issues and environmental issues are always coming together, right? So what does solar punk mean for just you and in your community? Um, so some things that you'll see pop up in solar punk stories is stuff that many of us do on a daily basis or have started to do. So getting to know your neighbors is part of solar punk literature, you know, supporting local agriculture. Um, like I said, I grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, where we have the Susquehanna River Valley. So helping to clean up that river, that's part of what solar punk looks like. You know, a publication on community during crisis and how to help that community, that's part of it. Volunteering at a food pantry, composting. All of these things are ideas that you'll see come up in solar punk literature and things that people do in the real world. And part of the project I'm working on right now is taking solar punk literature and taking um, ideas like this that are like real world activities we can go and do and combine them. So making sure that solar punk is not just fiction, but actually impacting people's real world communities. So we're gonna go ahead and watch a video on what solar punk is to try and actually take all these big ideas and condense it into what does this actually look like? So this is a short video called Dear Alice. Dear Alice, this place is yours now. It's a handful. The lot they weren't doing is easy. The land is more than just dirt. If you look after it, it will feed you forever. You're a smart one. I know you'll be okay if you're brave or shy. And remember, a business is only as good as its people, so treat them well. Our job is to plant seeds so our grandkids get to enjoy the fruit. So, eat well, Alice, and keep planting those seeds. Because how we eat today feeds tomorrow. Okay, so that is a great visual example of what solar punk is trying to do. It's trying to imagine these better worlds. So I'm curious, until the end, and Chobani showed up, did anyone notice that it was a Chobani yogurt ad? Right? Yeah, and that's something I oftentimes show this to my students, and at the end, Chobani comes up and they're like, wait, what? This is an advertisement? Um, and that's actually something that's been cropping up in solar punk that has been interesting, is that um, major like corporations like Chobani 
are recognizing that people are interested in a world like this. I mean, this is the world I hope that my grandchildren have. Um, and they're using it to make advertisements. Ikea did something similar to this where they had solar pump stories as part of their advertising. Um, so corporations are trying to get a hold of it, which has been really interesting. Um, but this video does a great job of demonstrating what solar punk looks like and what it can be like. And there's just a couple of things I want to point out that are sort of solar punk tropes at this point, you know, that you see pop up in solar punk stories. Some things that work great about this is we have this really strong sense of local community that shows up in this video. You know, we have this family that comes together, the people that work on the farm that come together, and they all sit down at a meal, and they're engaging in different ways with each other, and it's multi-generations. And we have this sense that they're working on building this community and family together. And that's very important to solar pump. Then you also have the technological aspects, right? We had some really interesting and fun technology that just showed up in this video. We obviously, you can see in the picture up here, we have the um, air. It looks like it's some sort of windmill that they've invented that you can kind of see in the background. We have this sense of there's still rural farming that is happening that's done by in a traditional method with you know, human farmers, but that technology is also assisting in that. Then we also have that you can go to the city. It's right there in the background, right? And it's this very green looking city, which is something you'll see in solar punk art everywhere. You'll see cities that look just like this. Um, but then of course we have solar panels, which even though that's not necessarily where the word solar punk comes from, it's definitely, you're always gonna see solar panels in solar punk literature. But at the same time, we're not rejecting um, older ways of doing things for technology. Like I love in this shot here, in the corner, you can see a normal looking bike. It hasn't been modified, it's just a bike, right? And so methods of transportation or things that work aren't necessarily being replaced by technology just to replace them. Like if, tech if this, you know, if the bike as a piece of technology still works, then that is gonna be used, that works great. So these are a couple of things that you'll see in a lot of solar pump stories. And I think this video, even though it is a Chobani yogurt ad, really does a great job capturing it. So I'm gonna give you some other examples to really show you the breadth of solar pump, um, mainly because solar pump doesn't have just one type of story it's telling, largely because it has this focus on community, which you can see in this video. So what a community needs in different parts of the US is gonna look very different what people need in Wheeling, West Virginia, it's gonna look very different than what people need in Reno, Nevada. And so thinking about how solar pump stories can address community needs in different locations is important and expands the type of stories that we have the ability to tell. So these are just some um, actually like descriptions of the stories that have been published in solar pump. I'm just gonna go through some of them. So a job applicant in TX Watson's The Boston Heart Project, Project explains how a so-called terrorist can be an otherwise helpless group salvation. Um, and this is actually one of my favorite solar pump stories. It's set in the very near future in Boston. And the idea is that a winter storm, an extreme winter storm is coming to Boston and it's going to hurt a lot of the people that don't have housing. So what the story suggests then is that this group of activists, um, they end up taking over a smart apartment complex. So this apartment complex that's empty, it's gonna be you know, sold to high as high end condos but it's smart, it has all this smart technology in it, so it's temper con temperature controlled, you know, it has like all these different elements to it. So what the group does is they hack into the apartment complex and then they open it up for the people who don't have housing to come spend the night so that way they can survive this winter storm. And I think that's a great example of technology and solar pump coming together, and it's very near future. You can imagine this happening in the next 10 years, you know, so this is something that could be happening. But then on the ver a very different story, on the other end of the spectrum, this is a short story that oftentimes gets reprinted as an example of solar punk is A.C. Wise's A Catalog of Sunlight at the End of the World. And this is just a beautiful short story that's about an old man who stays behind when the generation ships leave Earth. He feels that no one should die alone, including the planet. And this is just a beautiful meditation on relationships and on family and on people that tried to save what we think of as the world and ultimately failed. And it's a really beautiful lyrical story, but that is also solar punk even though this is a very different story than the first one that I gave an example of. And then another one that very often gets brought up in solar punk conversations is Solar Child by Camille Myers, a four-year-old Ella who, who, potentially, who, excuse me, who partially sustains herself through photosynthesis. She is threatened by religious zealots who oppose the genetic modification that gave her this ability. So once again, this is a very popular solar punk story that gets reprinted a lot. Um, and then two other examples from um, two different anthologies Eliza Victoria's Down the River, a botched sacrifice to a river leads to an ac acute examination of reparations. So once again, we have the sense of an environmental issue and the social issue that comes along with it. And then the heavenly, dream the heavenly Dreams of Mechanical Trees by Wendy Nickel. 
pictures a world in which artificial forests struggle to handle the functions of the real trees they replaced. Uh, and so this one is imagining, well, if our forests aren't you know, viable anymore because of climate change, how do we use technology to replace this and then what happens because of that? Um, so these are all very different stories, but yet they are all a part of solar punk. So solar punk really has this ability as a literature to see what is a problem that climate change or its attendant social issues might cause and how can we imagine a better outcome than something just going wrong, than like something terrible happening? How can we imagine a better future? And then this is the last sort of few examples I'm going to give you. This, um, I'm a creative writing professor, so I oftentimes help my students who want to write solar punk stories. I give them prompts and things like that, and I think these, some of these prompts get at some ideas in solar punk. Um, a group of cooks, dietitians, and teachers asked with tasked with creating and promoting well-rounded and tasty vegan and vegetarian cuisine in a world living through the culture shock of no affordable meat. What I love about this prompt is it's looking at this world where we might not be able to afford meat. The prompt is not saying that we should all be vegan or vegetarian, because that's not viable, right? What the prompt is saying is, what happens if we can't afford meat? You know, how do we make food that people want to eat, and how do we adjust to this? And I think that's important, is that there's this openness to different cultural aspects around meat, but it's like saying, okay, if we can't afford it, what do we do about that? How do we adjust? A community freshly moved into a new wooden sustainable climate controlled tower designed to help them be close to each other and live communally. For some, a dream come true. For others, a cultural shock. But everyone is struggling with traumas of losing their old homes to floods, fires, and relocation programs. So once again, looking at something that's very close and could be happening as a part of climate change, it is indeed happening. You know, we just saw the flood that happened in Dallas, right? And so people are having to relocate because of climate issues. And it's saying, how do we do this in a way that's good for people, that creates community, that is helpful, that helps people go through this shock, rather than just being like, all right, we have to house people. So it's looking at that problem and trying to come up with a solution. A community center, library, educational hub, initially set up to help people like coal miners respecialize and find other jobs, now becomes a place for unofficial pilgrimages of people striving to find their role in life and learn the history of those who lived it. What I really like about this prompt is it's really thinking into the future, right? It's imagining, all right, we solved some of the problems that come with climate change. And now we have a world where people can start really thinking about what do they want to do? What is my identity and my job? And start exploring that. And then these are some questions I oftentimes ask my students when, I'm think when they're writing solar punk stories. And it really focuses in on community, as I imagine you've picked up from all these prompts, right? It's thinking about a community problem. A contingent within the community demanded to be heard. Who are they? What are they asking for? What belief or practice helps to unify your community? What would be a good omen for your community? What would be a bad omen? So these are great prompts to help, your, to help students start thinking about solar punk and thinking about community and what issues might come up in community. And one of the reasons that I really want to emphasize community is because that's not always what's going on in US literature. US literature has a really strong focus on the individual. Um, so solar punk doesn't always conform to our ideas of storytelling. Dear Alice is actually a really great example of this. So that short video I showed you has, to me, a very satisfying little arc, right? We have sort of a beginning, middle, and end to this video. We have a really beautiful narration talking about a generational shift. Um, and it feels like a sort of little complete story whenever I watch it. But it doesn't really have what we would think of as a story, right? There's no conflict. There's no obstacle being overcome. It's just sort of this like almost introduction into this little world. But at the same time, I find it to be a very satisfying story. Um, so even though it doesn't have conflict, it can still be satisfying. But this is something that, as a creative writing teacher, I can tell you is not the best advice to give your students that there can't be conflict. Instead, solar punk, story solar punk storytelling has a focus on community rather than the individual. So it's not necessarily going to be about an individual hero overcoming a quest to do something or trying to like solve climate change. Instead, it's going to focus on meeting a community need or finding a solution to a community's problem, which starts to really fundamentally change how we think about storytelling. Um, in particular, there's not going to be a superhero moment, usually, in solar punk storytelling. And what I mean by that is I'm sure most of us have seen a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie at some point, and oftentimes in those movies there's some sort of showdown, right? The hero is going to fight the big bad guy at the end. And in solar punk storytelling, there isn't just quite that same type of narrative that's being told, but at the same time, that's what's really popular right now in the storytelling that we see, whether you're walking into a bookstore or you're going to the movies. Um, and so that actually leads to why I think there isn't necessarily going to be a big piece of solar punk literature that's going to become super popular, kind of like we saw with Blade Runner. Instead, I think we might see smaller stories that inspire people in their communities. So perhaps more like regional writing, which has a great and long history, 
um, particularly in this region. So I'm hoping that will become sort of more like regional writing. And solar punk and the struggles that it has is sort of mirroring some of the problems that we're having in environmental literature as well. When we're writing about climate change, um, some of our great environmental thinkers have already pointed out that there are some problems and some struggles that we have when coming and trying to write about this, mainly because climate change is this really big entangled issue. So how can we start to break it down using the storytelling tools that we have now? So Amitav Ghosh claims that climate change resists serious fiction. So for literary fiction or you know, just sort of your regular fiction that isn't science fiction and fantasy, it can be really hard to write about climate change um, and then it actually to the point that it feels like it's resisting it. And mainly because a lot of US literature has that focus on the individual. And climate change, while it does impact individuals, rather we see it impacting communities, right? Like it's part of that individual in that community that's being impacted by a flood or is being impacted by a wildfire. Rob Nixon is, argues that the, the, part of the difficulty in writing about the climate crisis is time. Um, the ultimate effects of climate change are this what he calls slow violence. So in other words, one of the problems about writing about climate change or even thinking about climate change is that a lot of the effects take a really long time to come out. So you can, use, you can think about pollution as part of this, right? If an area becomes polluted, you don't necessarily see the impacts right away. You're going to see it 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the line. And so capturing that span in a novel becomes harder and harder, particularly when it's something that's kind of invisible, like pollution. You know, how do you write about that as a conflict in a novel? And then what, Emory Seisman or notes that the publishing industry, like so many industries, relies on fossil fuels. So like a big industry, it uses a lot of fossil fuels. It's a major polluter. Um, and so what's going to happen to literature and publishing when that's just no longer available in the way that it has been for the past, you know, 100 years since the novel's really gotten started? And so one of the things I'm asking myself and I ask my students pretty often, is solar punk antithetical to traditional storytelling methods? Can we use this traditional storytelling methods that we've used in U.S. literature for the past 70, 30 years, 70 years, 100 years to write about solar punk? And I'm not sure. That's something I'm still trying to figure out for myself. So I am a creative writing teacher, so I got to break down solar punk a little bit in terms of craft. This is just one of the things I love to talk about. Um, and writing solar punk stories is hard, um, and mainly because in the US, we're taught what good writing is. And some of you probably can pick this up from the books that you've read already. A singular close point of view, a focus on a main character, this idea that these, active ra these characters need to be active and around. Um, they need to change by the end of the book novel. A plot with a climax you know, that comes up to this big moment and then comes down to the end. Fast-paced scenes leaning heavily on dialogue, active voice rather than passive voice, a prominent author's voice or style, and a beginning, middle, and end with a resolution. So some of you have probably picked up on a lot of these things when reading novels yourselves. Um, and I think beginning, middle, and end to, to this idea of having a satisfying revolution is perhaps resolution is probably one of the hardest things to capture when it comes to climate change. Because this idea of the climate changing is going to have these really big overarching impacts. Um, but how are we going to capture that in one novel about a person in a, in a small space? How are we going to be able to do that in 300 pages to actually talk about climate change in a meaningful way? So how can we use these frameworks to tell these stories, particularly because climate change does not have an end in sight? Just like um, we go back to the example of a polluted area, that doesn't go away. It takes years of cleanup. It takes years of work by that community to make that space safe again. So there's not necessarily an end to that story. Rather, there's perhaps a break point where you might end your story, but there's not going to be an end to that situation. That situation is going to continue and continue to impact the people of that community for a, time, for a long time to come. So it becomes difficult to actually have a satisfying ending in a way that feels good as a reader when you put that book down when you're telling those kind of stories. So when you're crafting solar punk stories or when you're thinking about solar punk stories, I always encourage my students to think small, to think about small communities, not necessarily trying to address everything all at once. That there's no single worldwide solution to the climate crisis or the interconnected social justice issues. Instead, the goal of a solar punk story is not to solve climate change. The goal is to help a community adapt and transform and to thrive. So we're not trying to suggest that, or what I'm not trying to suggest is that solar punk is a one-on-one -on -one fix, you know, fits everyone solution to problems. Rather, it can be a way to tell stories that can help us imagine different outcomes to these problems. But ultimately, solar punk should also be about having fun. Um, so the reason, one of the reasons that the punk is so important to solar punk 
is that it's meant to be a good time. It's not meant to just be um, dry literature. That's another reason why it's important that it comes from science fiction and fantasy. It's meant to be imaginative. It's meant to be creative. It's meant to be taking us to different places that we haven't seen before. Um, and that's an important aspect of solar punk that I think can't be forgotten as we're sort of thinking about solar punk and thinking about it as a literature. Um, the climate crisis is, of course, scary. Climate change is scary. But solar punk is about moving through that fear and working towards better tomorrows. So this idea of hope through action is oftentimes how I summarize it. So I know I've said the word solar punk like a hundred times at this point, and I just want to make sure I hit on what the punk is exactly, because oftentimes I get asked this whenever I talk about solar punk. People are like, well, what exactly is the punk in solar punk? Um, and one of the things that I talk about is like punk is obviously more than just a music, um, and it's always been very do-it-yourself. So, you know, whether it's just, you know, making clothing that better fits the aesthetic, or building spaces um, where a show might happen, punk has always had that DIY part to it. Punk has always been community focused, um, even if it's just community around a music. And then solar punk also tries to undermine, dismantle, and reimagine oppressive systems. So part of the punk of solar punk is that it should be fun. Um, and this is not, of course, just referencing the music, it's some of the larger ideas around punk. So why do we need solar punk stories? One of the reasons I come out and talk about solar punk is comes back to this idea that climate change cannot be solved. Even with progress that we've been making, communities in the US and around the world are still going to feel these very severe impacts. And they're going to feel these impacts even if we were to make all the changes necessary tomorrow. There's still going to be an impact from climate change at this point, whether that's just in, in um, continued heat rising, um, flooding, things like that. So regardless of the changes being made, we still are going to have to adapt to this situation right now. Um, government intervention is often slow, particularly in rural communities, which means that the local community, that you and your neighbors, are the first boots on the ground. You're the, you know, we are the people who are going to have to take charge if a climate disaster happens. So part of that is thinking then, well, how can we work toward a better future and make sure our communities are better prepared to address this issue when it happens? And part of that is just what can we imagine? You know, in some ways we are limited by our imagination, and so it's important to not just be imagining dystopias, but instead be imagining these positive futures. Because if we haven't at least imagined it, then it's going to be very hard to achieve it. So one of the things, as I mentioned at the beginning of this project, is I'm working on taking solar punk from just storytelling into action. So I'm a big believer that we need more than just environmental literature at this point. Instead, we need stories that are going to impress upon the reader actions that they can take um, to prepare their communities, to better adapt to these situations, to be ready if something were to happen. Um, and then also celebrating the actions that we're already taking. There has been great success in stopping polluting and stopping different um, resource extraction, things like that. So how can we celebrate what's already happened? So thinking ahead to what our community needs is something I've been actively working on in my own solar punk writing and in my own literature. And for instance, so my community in Williamsport, um, Pennsylvania, we need a lot of river cleanup. We had mining in that part of the state, and we also had fracking more recently. So we need areas to help work on making that water safe for people to use. We need community gardens, preparation for superstorms and extreme flooding, which we saw a very extreme flooding in the 70s. So we know it could definitely happen in our state, and we want to make sure that we're really prepared for it. More emergency food and shelter access and so on. So these are just some things that when I'm sitting down and thinking, what, what, can I, what skills can I bring to my community, things that come to mind. And sort of sitting down and taking that sort of measure of what you can do is important to thinking about how do we move from just being aware of climate change to preparing for something to happen in our community. So my latest book, which is Almanac for the Anthropocene, a Compendium of Solar Punk Futures, which I co-edited, um, is very much about this. It comes out from West Virginia University Press. And it is a nonfiction collection thinking about what can we do and how can we teach people through writing to be able to go out and make a difference in their community. Um, so these are just some examples of the pieces we have in here. What I really love about this collection is it has everything from essays to blueprints to how-to articles to more philosophical pieces. So there's a little bit of something in there for everyone. Um, but some pieces that kind of fit with what I've been talking about today. Um, one of my favorites is it's a really short piece that's called Visible Mending, a recipe for beautiful and sustainable clothing. Um, and it's a, basically it teaches the reader the steps to sew and patch their own clothes. Um, now, my generation, I was not taught that skill from my parents or my grandparents. 
So this is something that I've actually had to like go out and look, be like, okay, how do I learn this skill? Like I want to know how to like sew on a button. So this has been really helpful in sort of showing, you know, this is a little example of like, okay, here's how you patch your favorite flannel shirt that you don't want to throw away. Um, Appalachian solar pump growing trees from seed for the plant revolution. Um, this is another one of my favorites because it talks about the importance of food bearing trees, so like chestnut trees, um, and what we can do to bring them back, um, and also how to grow these seedlings and plant them around the space that you live. And it gives you all the different tools, it gives you advice, it gives you different composting tips, um, and it's a really cool piece that just sort of goes over how to do it. So if you don't know how to do this, this is like a piece that can help teach that. Uh, we have a great piece on foraging, um, and I love that not only does it talk about like how to forage safely, but it also talks about removing invasive species and then what you can do with the things you forage. Not just food, but also cider. And um, one of my res one recipe I really want to try is he uh, teaches you how to make walnut ink. And as a writer, like making my own ink sounds cool. Like I, I would like to try that. Um, Multi-species community garden is another one of my favorites because it's um, actually a giant poster example, so it's all visuals. And it walks you through how to take an empty lot and turn it into a space for people and other animals like birds and butterflies and pollinators to enjoy. And it visually step-by-step -step kind of shows you what that looks like. There's also some articles in here that are tech-based because solar pump does have an interest in technology as well. And this one is, um, I think, really cool, how to build a solar-powered website because I had never thought to myself, oh, I can run a website off solar power. It felt very, that feels very difficult and like it should be not something I can do. But this whole, this article goes over how to do it and even gives pictures on how to do it, which is pretty cool. And then finally, Feeding Imagination goes over how a food forest works, how to make compost, and how other sort of permaculture farming techniques. Now these aren't all the pieces in the book, but I think they give you some examples of how people are taking ideas that you find in solar punk. So all of these ideas you can definitely find in solar punk stories and tra translating them into actual actions and like ways that people are changing their lives. So one of the reasons that I think we should be thinking about this and like one way that you can start sort of approaching this is just thinking about what kind of skills you have, what skills can you contribute to your community, and then what needs are in your community. Because sometimes what I find is particularly um, for folks in my generation, we have certain, we all have a similar set of skills that aren't necessarily what our community needs. So for instance, I teach um, English and creative writing, so I can lead a book club. That is something, I know how to talk about books. But at the same time, that's not necessarily what my community needs right now. There's a lot of people already doing that work, and so what other skills do I have that I can bring to my community? So being honest about that I think is a really good step. And then is there a way to connect your skills with those needs? So thinking about what needs the community has, being honest about what skills you have, and then trying to make that connection. And then one of the um, sort of last things I want to bring up, because I think this is really useful and something I've been thinking about a lot in terms of my own work and in my own uh, solar punk writing, is passing and sharing skills. Um, so I'm sure some of you probably know the writer Wendell Berry. He's also a poet. Um, and he has this great quote from one of his newer books called The Art of Loading Brush. And the quote goes, now he said, we're practicing the art of loading brush. It is a fundamental art, an indispensable art. Now I know about your fine arts, your music and literature and all that. I've been to school too, and I'm telling you, they're optional. The art of loading brush is not optional. And ever since I read that, I've been just thinking about that and chewing on that for a couple of years. Because, um, you know, I very much come from that fine arts background. You know, I've got my PhD, I teach in academia, but at the same time I recognize that I don't know how to load brush. Like this is something that no one has taught me, nor have I sought out this knowledge. And that's something that I've been really trying to shift and change in my thinking about. I'm lucky enough that my husband is a certified arborist and grew up on a farm, so he does know how to load brush, so I have been learning how to do it from him. Um, but thinking about what skills that we have that we can share and pass along and apprentice with other people, I think is something that's really valuable work that people who are interested in solar pump can do. Um, and part of that, I think, is also saving skills from industry. I saw recently a uh, video that was going around where a lot of skills um, are going out, are just basically dying off because there's no one to apprentice because we now we have big industrial complexes that can make these things, whether it's pottery, um, arrow fletching was one that was on the list which I thought was really cool, and things like that. So skills that need to be saved and kept alive, um, and what, how can we like pass those along? And then also, what is taught that is that what used to be taught that is now being bought instead, and how can we reverse that? Um, and some of you might have noticed there's been like a rise in people interested in foraging. 
um, myself included. And there's actually been a lot of people teaching how to forage on different social media websites. So even like TikTok, like the little video sharing website, there's been people that go out and like, here's what this looks like. You know, here's how you can forage garlic mustard. And we'll show you the plant, show you what you can do with it, show you recipes they've made. And it's been really cool to see how that is being taught to, to the next generation through technology, you know, that we have recently invented. Um, Arise in textile arts is another one. So many of my friends have become started embroidering or teaching themselves to sew um, or knit, myself included. And then also a rise in oral storytelling. This is one I've been particularly invested in. I think my generation and the generation, generation Z has really become invested in telling stories together through games, um, where everyone sits around a table and tells like Dungeons and Dragons stories together or something like that. And I wonder how that might connect to, you know, how our parents and grandparents used to maybe tell stories um, on the porch or around the, you know, at potlucks or something like that. And I think we're continuing an oral storytelling culture that goes back to like cowboy poetry and things like that, but in a really unique, interesting fantasy way, which I find really fascinating. Um, so that's kind of the thought I want to leave you with today is this idea of passing and sharing skills. I think that's something that could be really great for solar punk um, and something that I've been really invested in myself. So I know we got a couple minutes for questions, so I just want to go ahead and open it up for questions. I have copies of, unfortunately, not my um, book from West Virginia University Press that is shipping, so you can order it online. But I have um, a collection of solar punk fiction that I co-edited that is available for sale too. But happy to take questions. Yes. Oh, good. Okay, I'm glad to hear um, that I was explained well and I got what solar punk is. Thank you. Yes, I do. Thank you. I hope so. I hope it is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, um, cyberpunk in the 80s sort of being competitive with solar punk now and sort of changing these ideas and kind of maybe a tension between the two, right? You see that almost in uh, just about any of that era. Mm -hmm. uh, really, what we also saw was so going on in the 80s too. But you also see in the future those kind of revert back to what the future you probably do not want to say that you're out. Uh, and the second part, um, and I think we really need Yeah, I definitely think so. The question is, does solar punk have to come back to this sort of didactic aspect? Like, can it get to, here's how we actually bring this world around? And yeah, I think that was starting to be missing from solar punk. It's such a young literature that it's more that, not so much that it's missing so much as this is a gap and we should make sure it doesn't become a missing part of solar punk. Um, and so, yeah, and I think, too, that comes back to um, kind of what you're saying about cyberpunk, right? Is that solar punk is very much in... I don't want to say reaction in like a bad way, but certainly in a sense of, oh, we don't want this future. Like this is a future that's sad. <laughs> you know, we don't want to live in this world. We want to instead imagine a world where we can live in. Um, and Solar Punk is definitely very much in conversation with that. In fact, the third anthology that I'm co-editing that'll be, or excuse me, that I'm editing, I'm not co-editing that one, that's coming out next year is um, Cyberpunk and Solar Punk Stories and the transition between the two of them. So it starts in a cyberpunk world, and then the stories slowly transition to a more solar punk world from a bunch of different writers. So yes, it's very much in conversation with that. But then an important part of that is exactly what you said, is I think we want to make sure that these stories don't um, obscure, that we need to actually make steps toward correcting things or towards changing things or preparing for things, um, preparing to adapt. Um, and so we want to make sure these stories actually demonstrate how to do that. And some, some sort of solar punk stories, like as fiction, definitely do, which has been really fun to see. But it felt like nonfiction might be the better form to address some of these ideas. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can't fight that idea, but you can't, uh, you can't do that. Mm -hmm, exactly. And then that's another reason why for this piece of nonfiction was to address just that, that people are already doing things like yes. solar and wind in their own home. Um, and so we might as well start addressing that and like formalizing it in some ways, um, so that way other people can learn how to do it. So, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the question is um, whether or not solar punk was moving towards such pure fantasy that it was maybe losing some of its more anarchic aspects. Um, and I'm glad that you brought this up too because um, there's a lot, a lot of anarchists like solar punk. Not all solar punks like anarchists, which I think is interesting. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there's a lot of that. In fact, one of our great solar punk thinkers right now um, very much makes a lot of videos about this, and I'd recommend that you look up um, Andrewism. I think we'll bring it up, and if not, even though this isn't his handle anymore, if you Google Saint Andrew, that will probably bring it up too. And he's primarily on YouTube, um, and he makes some great videos on this. But yeah, and I think there is space for solar punk to have that more fantasy aspect. Um, but at the same time, when I'm sitting down to edit an anthology. I always want to have that spectrum. So I don't mind if I have a story that's like far, far future, because I think imagining what that world looks like is important too. But then I want something that's also like 10 years from now. Like, what are we doing to transition? Um, and I've been lucky enough that there are people working on both ends of those spectrums. But yeah, and I hope too that exactly like you said, that particularly the nonfiction anthology works to perhaps repoliticize. Um, solar pumps in a bit of a transition. As, I, as you can see with the Chobani yogurt ad, um, that there is um, people who want to take the non-political aspects of it and profit off of that. And then it's just gonna be about how, how do we see what happens? Because the same thing happened to cyberpunk, right? Like cyberpunk was declared dead in the 80s by its creators for that very reason, partially because of Blade Runner. Um, and so solar pumps kind of right in that moment and we're not, I mean, who knows how it's gonna play out. But I think people, um, I think there's enough ground interest, you know, by people who are doing DIY work, that are doing activist work, that it's not gonna quite implode the way cyberpunk did. I don't think that's gonna happen. So hopefully that gets to your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So thinking about how do we tie what we know about climate change with what we know in a literary sense. And I would actually, I think um, the question asker answered their own question. I definitely at least bring it back to the regional, mainly because climate change is going to look so different across the US, let alone globally. So if you're trying to write a novel, or you're trying to write or sort of think about climate change in a way that you're encompassing all of it, that's gonna be nearly impossible, right? Like that's why we have to break it down by region. And so whenever I'm working with writers or with students who are thinking about this, I encourage them to go locally and regionally. What are the problems in your region? What are some of the ways that climate change is going to impact your region? You can actually see this if you go to the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC reports. They have data on different regions. So you can go look up your region see what's gonna happen um, over the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years, and prepare for that. So yeah, I think ultimately um, you answered your own question, and I definitely think that it's gonna be regional is the way to go, um, and like thinking about communities as well in those regions is a, is a good way to go. So. Any other questions? How does economics yeah. Now, you might have said that when you said that the one um, thing was to show me how to sew. My clothes when I was growing. 
why go to buy material today to sew? It's cheaper for me to buy than it is for me to sew. So how do economic figure into climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. So how do economics figure into climate change? And the example is sewing and how clothes used to be handmade and sewed, including in recent generations. But now it's cheaper to go buy clothes rather than just buy the material. And I think, yeah, and that's a really great question. And that's kind of the hard spot that we're in, right? And that's why um, economically, I don't push for individual change for people. Like, I don't think recycling, an uh, individual person paying to have a recycling bin out, if you live in a place where you have to pay, I live in a place where I have to pay, um, to have recycling is going to fix climate change. Now, recycling, because you want to do it, because it renews your connection to the earth, and you're thinking, okay, I'm doing something better with this stuff rather than throwing it away. Now, that is worth doing and worth paying the money for. But yeah, economically, making individual choices to for more sustainable action is not viable or feasible for many people. Um, so ultimately, it's going to come down to, um, at, some, at some point, it's probably going to tip. So like one example of the solar punk prompts was where meat was no longer affordable, right? Because to buy like meat that is made in a sustainable way or that is like like organic or you know raised locally is way more expensive usually um, unless you can buy a big bulk order, um, which most people can't. So, but in the prompt and in the solar pump thinking, it was like, okay, what happens when we reach that point though, where because of carbon credits or different rules, whatever you want to say, meat is no longer that affordable. What changes? How do people react to that? So I think solar pump can actually be a tool to start thinking ahead to what happens when clothes are no longer fast fashion. You know, where you can buy a bunch of clothing for the same amount of price that it would take to make one thing. Um, and how can we address that? But then, yeah, exactly. You know, ultimately, individual action is very pricey when it comes to sustainable living and thinking. Um, and it's going to come down to if you want to make your own clothes and have the money to do so. Like, I certainly have friends who do that because they enjoy it. And it's a, you know, a skill that they enjoy and a craft that they enjoy. And so they practice it. Um, but yeah, we're kind of in that catch-22 right now. So, a great question. Yeah, those are two great questions. So I'll start with the first one about dystopia being popular than ever and what do we find interesting or in engaging about dystopias. And I'll start off by saying, like, I also really like dystopias. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I've studied it and taught it and written about it. Um, and I think um, what oftentimes people say is that dystopias are um, have a sense of catharsis because we're imagining the worst. We're like, okay. I have seen what the worst is. Like, this is what, you know, gets me interested. This is the worst. So now I don't have to be afraid of that as much anymore. Um, so that's oftentimes a common um, interpretation. I don't find that very satisfying, so I'm not really sure why we're that interested in dystopias. I think perhaps in the same way that we're interested in action-adventure movies and movies like Jack Reacher or, you know, Mission Impossible, is that it comes down to, you know, they are... They're, you know, we're watching someone who is surviving at this very intense level of skill, and there's just something really engaging about that. And a lot of times, dystopias like show, demonstrate that as well. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think it's dystopias show us the worst, and we're we're like, okay, we've seen the worst now. Um, yeah. And then your second question um, was about people re um, re relying on science potentially to save us in terms of climate change. I think the same can actually be said of technology. A lot of people are like, oh, well, we'll find a piece of technology that will save us in some way, that will remove the carbon or the CO2 gases, you know, things like that. Um, and like, yes, we might at some point, and I think people that rely on that, like, yes, that might happen at some point. But right now, we are still going to have the immediate impacts of climate change affecting us for at least the next 10 to 20 years, even if we had that technological miracle or that scientific miracle happen tomorrow. Um, and so we still need to prepare our communities and be prepared ourselves for like drought conditions that maybe we haven't, that no other generation has seen or intense flooding that is like happening not every hundred years, but instead every five years. So unfortunately we're at this point in climate change that the impact is going to be felt now and for the next decades, regardless of whether or not we have a fix. So even though I think there is, we should always, you know, there is hope to be had in science and technology, 
thinking about that as some sort of ultimate fix is not going to help our communities right now, which is what I'm invested in ultimately. I want to make sure my community is adapted and living well now. Um, and, and science isn't necessarily having, so that's not the concern of science. The concern of science is very different. So that's kind of my response to that is I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but that's not what our communities need in the moment. Thank you all for listening. If you have other questions, please feel free to come up.